combination of space. Okay, <laughs> here's the deal. I'll, I'll keep my welcome and introduction very brief. If, uh, uh, if, if we can start uh, more or less on time. So thank you all uh, for being here. Uh, I am certainly looking forward to this day. It's an incredibly interesting day for my college, for the University of Arizona College of Law, because we have had long-standing interest in the broad range of issues around space law, uh, but no deep expertise in the area. And that does not put us in an unusual place with regard to American law schools. I mean, space science and astronomy at the University of Arizona is an incredible strength. At Stewart Observatory, Lunar and Planetary Labs, the Mirror Lab, I, uh, when our new, well now uh, five years, President Robbins, when he was a new president and he came in and was welcomed at the university and did a, uh, a welcoming event on a Friday evening and he heard about the Mirror Lab, which was a good 150 feet away from where we were. And he said, that sounds incredible. I want to see it. So at seven at night, we walked over to the Mirror Lab and banged in the door. And there was one person of course, working, it's Friday night, of course, working late, he came out and said, who are you and what do you want? And I said, well, it doesn't really matter who I am, but this is the new president of the university. And he turned to President Robbins and said, really? President Robbins said, well, yes. And he said, well, let me give you a tour. Um, so, so, so we're a university that, you know, sends a rocket to Benham and does this amazing uh, uh, work on so many fronts. Uh, and yet over the years, people have come to me outside and inside the university, including one who's here, Ken Swindle, and basically said, why isn't the law school training the future lawyers for, well, Space Force wasn't here, but essentially both for civilian and military space. Why isn't the law school training the future heads of NASA? And then in a world where the law and regulation of space, versions of private space, the move towards an awareness of information as a commodity in space, the dramatic increase in uh, national security and defense issues in space has just highlighted uh, those questions for us. And today uh, is an effort uh, by us with your help uh, to begin or to extend uh, engagement on these issues. What that means is that we've invited many of you to our new friends. Right? So often academics, when they host conferences or workshops, call the people they know and have worked with for years. And in this case, so many of you are new and yet you stepped forward and we're willing to be a part of this. And we're greatly appreciative for that. My colleague, Chris Griffin, uh, took the lead along with the fantastic U of A uh, DC team, federal relations and the DC team in organizing this. So with that, uh, I'm going to save any more profound comments, if I have them, to the end of the day after the panels have uh, uh, met and uh, just, uh, again, thank the breadth and depth uh, and participation of all the speakers and, and, and my several colleagues at the U of A, including uh, Stephen Fomey, who will uh, be the moderator of the first panel. Let's see. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. The only button I had to flip was one button. Green lights on. Okay, we have power. Wonderful. <laughs> And Aaron is going to get our slides up. I'll use the lab mic. Yeah. Thanks. Um, hi, I'm Stephen Fleming. I'm with a, a different part of the University of Arizona, not part of the law school. Uh, I work over at the College of Optics, uh, but I've been in the space business for a while. And I see slides coming up, so I'll wait for a second. There we go. Thanks so much. Um, I want to follow up on some things that Mark said uh, about the University of Arizona and space exploration. So this is not the legal part of the discussion, this is more of a uh, getting setting some of the scientific uh, boundaries. Um, who am I? I've been. I need to get out of the way of this not this uh, screen. Here we go. Uh, been at University of Arizona since 2017. I helped form the Space Roundtable. I've been a venture capital investor. I've been an angel investor in a bunch of space uh, companies, some of which you've heard of, most of which you haven't, some of which you've gone bankrupt. Uh, but I, I decided for this talk to show a slide, which is a little amusing because it's from the Washington Post here uh, from uh, 32 years ago today. <laughs> and that was me, 100 pounds lighter. Uh, and I actually got an op-ed published in the Washington Post about mining the asteroids. Uh, and as far as I can tell, that was the first Washington Post reference to uh, using space resources to help life here on Earth. 
Uh, and if you really want to read that op-ed, it's on my blog. You, you can find it easily. But, uh, but that was uh, that was me as a, as a baby, uh, and I've been doing it uh, ever since. So um, University of Arizona has been doing this for a long time. Um, I moved there almost six years ago, and as far as I knew, Arizona's history was face flight was this. Um, and I went, you know, why, why would you be doing anything with rockets out in Arizona with all the cactus? Well, it turns out that the space business in Arizona started all the way back in 1916 with the founding of Stewart Observatory. So it's over, over 100 years old. Uh, that was surrounded by cows at the time. It is now surrounded by lots of campus buildings. Uh, so it's grown a good bit. But it really came into high gear unexpectedly uh, with this guy, Gerard Kuiper. Uh, happens to be the only individual uh, with craters named after him on three planets. Um, and... Uh, he came to Arizona because the weather in Chicago was terrible. Um, because he was with the Yerkes Observatory, and he couldn't look at the uh, at the sky all that often because it was cloudy and cold. Uh, so he came to Arizona in 1960, and he was one of the few professional astronomers at that time who was really focused on things in the solar system, not looking at black holes, not looking at other galaxies, not looking at stellar evolution, but looking at planets and moons. Um, and so uh, he formed Lunar and Planetary Laboratory, which Tim Swindle here ran for a number of years. I don't know how many. A few. Uh, Tim, Tim Swindle was uh, one, one of the directors of Lunar and Planetary Laboratory. Um, and as it turned out, in 1960, things were happening with the moon where people wanted to go. Uh, and so it turned out University of Arizona was the place that had most of the data on the lunar surface and published the first modern lunar atlas. Um, got involved with the, uh, the, the Ranger uh, program, which was orbiters uh, mapping uh, Apollo or map, mapping the sites for Apollo uh, and then backing up. So, so University of Arizona has been deeply involved with space exploration since the days of Apollo. Uh, we did a bunch of unmanned things. We, uh, we helped fix the Hubble. Uh, we put a spectrometer around Saturn. Uh, we built the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, our help build, which uh, was basically a spy satellite around Mars, which is still there. Uh, if you have a very large coffee table, we will sell you a book uh, of the photographs taken from the Mars Reconnaissance Observatory. If you don't have a coffee table, you can buy this book and attach four legs to it because it's about two and a half feet square. It's an enormous book, beautiful. Um, and then we actually were the first public university uh, to be primed on a NASA uh, planetary mission. We, we ran the Mars Phoenix program, which was the lander that went to the poles of Mars. Uh, that was managed on campus at the University of Arizona. Uh, we're still doing lots of things. I'm, I'm obviously going really fast, because this is just to give you folks a flavor of the sorts of things we do. Uh, we've had the number one astronomy program for as long as it's been measured. Uh, more than half of the, uh, the uh, uh, known near-Earth asteroids were discovered in the Catalina Sky Survey. It's not Catalina Island off of LA. It's the Catalina Mountains north of Tucson is where the Catalina Sky Survey is performed. Um, no other university has its own radio telescope. We have two. Uh, we have amazing assets. Uh, where I work, the optics program is perennially ranked number one in the country. Uh, if it's not number one, it's number two. And the drop off from number two to number three is pretty severe. So we have an extraordinary optics program. Uh, and Osiris Rex. So we were primed on a billion dollar mission, uh, which uh, successfully went out and booped an asteroid. Uh, got some samples and it's on its way back and it's going to land uh, under a year now, at least September of next year, uh, with, we, we hope, uh, a couple of kilograms of asteroid samples, which will be uh, an amazing research asset. Um, Mark mentioned the uh, mirror lab. This is one of the mirrors being fabricated. Uh, yes, that's a person for scale. Uh, and, and this telescope has seven of those. It's, it's bigger than this room. It's enormous. Uh, going in down in Chile, we're building the mirrors for that. Uh, if you saw the images of black holes being processed uh, in the last couple of years, a lot of the processing for that happened on a University of Arizona computer system called Cyverse, which is funded by NSF. Um, we have a new NASA mission, uh, NEOSM or NEO Survey, or name, names change, uh, which is basically going to be a space telescope looking for planetary threats for asteroids that might like this. Uh, and we do stuff in on balloons as well. So this is uh, every every Antarctic summer. Uh, some of our folks go down and uh, launch uh, terrorist astronomy uh, into the stratosphere using balloons from Antarctica. We also have, and Vishnu is supposed to be here, uh, one of our uh, 
people who work on space domain awareness. We have an enormous program on that. About 25 graduate students a year we, we put into military and civil positions about deciding what's in space and where it's going. And finally, Biosphere, uh, a lot of you may have been there, um, obviously created for other reasons. Now they use a research facility on how to keep humans alive uh, in, in, in hot environments. So we have a, a lunar greenhouse. Um, last thing I like to point out is if you look at the AAU universities, the top universities in the country, uh, and what experience they have in space science, space operations, which we've talked about, uh, the business and finance world with our Eller School, public policy and law, which is Mark with the uh, Rogers Law School, and mining. We still have a, a top-notch mining school, which most AAU universities know. Uh, really, University of Arizona is the only place uh, where all of those intersect. So uh, we think that for space resource development, U of A is going to be a, a, a core of that going forward for the next 100 years. Uh, we have an industry in town. I'm not going to talk about in detail. It starts with Raytheon, goes down to startups. Lots of people that create companies, and this is my commercial. Uh, we created the Space Business Roundtable about five years ago when I moved to town, and we've actually seen deals done. We've seen people get hired. We've seen students get internships. We're seeing interaction between the companies in the Tucson area. So there's there's a lot going on. Um, with that, I'm going to stop talking. Um, we'll do Q&A for everybody at the end. But this was really trying to give a quick overview of why the University of Arizona cares about the space business, uh, why we care about the legalities surrounding the space business. We've been doing this for 60 years in a big way, and uh, we want to keep doing it in, in multiple ways. Um, with that, um, I think what I'll do is just very quickly just say the names of each of our speakers so we know who's sitting up here, uh, and then each of them will come to the podium for a brief uh, discussion. But um, between the three of us, we have about 40 minutes of material and we have about an hour and a half to fill. Uh, so we all can all do math and you'll realize that unless you get involved, it's gonna be really embarrassing and really boring. Uh, so once, once uh, each of the brief presentations are done, we really want most of this to be a moderated Q&A uh, and get the audience engaged and, uh, and ask, ask lots of questions to be prepared for those. So just wanna uh, uh, introduce uh, briefly from, from one end to the next. Uh, you've got them all on your handout, but John Reed from ULA. Ron Vonderdung from many places, including the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, and uh, Laura Montgomery from Catholic University and her own consulting firm here in town. So uh, with that, uh, John is uh, John has got, uh, come on up. Uh, John has got, and Aaron, if we can get the slides, there we go. Um, John has got the coolest title uh, of anybody I've met in a long time. Uh, is uh, John is chief rocket scientist at ULA at the United Launch Alliance. So uh, I'm, I'm jealous of his title and jealous of the toys he gets to play with. So uh, once his slides are up and there they are, John, take it away. Thanks. Well, first, thank you all for uh, inviting me to be here. Uh, doing the lab mic or doing the, that mic? Is that one? I think we turned that one off. Oh, this one is on. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to turn mine off. No, but I figured I'd go ahead and stand at the podium and talk. So, um, you know, I guess Tori has been talking about cislunar and the three trillion dollar econosphere for a while, and I've been following in his footsteps and talking about it pretty widely. Um, but figured I would take this opportunity to kind of set the stage a little bit before we get into the policy and law aspects. Um, I, I appreciated the pointing out Osiris Rex and other missions. Um, it's kind of interesting to work for the one company that has flown missions to every planet in the solar system. And, you know, everything that you guys talked about with looking at near Earth objects is near and dear as well. Um, and I did want to say a little bit about the approach that we take because um, the way we operate is we've launched 150 odd times with the Atlas and Delta families as United Launch Alliance. It's a joint venture of Lockheed and Boeing. So we have that heritage of both those rocket programs. Uh, and so the experience that base that we draw on really does focus us on the mission that the customer has. And, and I say that because it really does shape how we engage in the marketplace as well. And we'll touch more on that later. But having this history of flying to all these different bodies gives us a different perspective on the economy and the resources and the opportunities that are ahead of us. And so I just wanted to set the stage with that fact, since 
as we talk about the resources and rights and everything, knowing what's out there and knowing how we've determined what's out there is really relevant to that conversation. I think one of the, the missions on here that's near and dear to my heart is the LRO L Cross mission, which was an Atlas Centaur flight with NASA. We launched that. What the secondary payload wanted to do was look for water in the pole. And the way they chose to do that was to leverage our upper stage as an impactor to go strike the pole of the moon, hit in a dark crater and see what got knocked up. And so what we found obviously was a lot of water when that happened, but it really relied on the ability of us as a launch service provider to configure and set that stage up such that my upper stage that is fueled by hydrogen and oxygen, when it hit the moon, you weren't gonna see us, you were gonna see whatever was there. And so we went through a lot of work and effort to try and figure out how do I make sure the tanks are empty? How do I make sure the foam is dry? Excuse me. And how do I make sure that the system is gonna be configured in a way where that secondary mission could control the stage and strike the impact point that it needed to. Um, and obviously we were successful with that. Um, what we found and what they then estimated from that impact was that not only is there water, but there's a lot of water on the moon. Um, now, from my perspective, water is something that I easily convert to propellant, but we'll get to that a little bit more in a minute. I think the thing that was interesting to me is that really spawned a conversation around the community about how much water is there? We've got some in. Okay, sure. Do that. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay. Um, so I think what was most interesting to me was the debate that occurred as a result of having this one data point. And what does that really mean from a, a resources standpoint? We obviously lean forward with saying that we think that this, the estimate when you look at all the craters and all the little blue dots that are on there that indica indicate likely points of water in the moon inside of those dark craters uh, could mean as much as 20 billion metric tons, which is over a hundred years of current demand for propellant in space. The thing that's interesting is a lot of people were saying, no, no, it can't be that much. Recently, there's been research done to figure out, well, how did we end up with water on the moon in the first place? And so some scientists out at Colorado School of Mines went and developed a model of what were the ways that the Earth accumulated water and what would that mean for the moon circling the Earth as that process is, is happening. And what they found with their estimates for how it would all then um, evaporate or move out into space from the moon versus how it behaved on Earth, their estimate was actually double what our most idealistic estimate was for what they think the actual amount of water that should be somewhere in the moon would be today. And so it's interesting to see that while we don't want to necessarily lean too far forward, there are lots of theories that say it could be even more than we think. So the bottom line is we've got a lot of water out there in the moon. You know, I, I think there are still challenges for how we can extract it. And so we'll touch on that in some of the conversation today too. But why do I think water at the moon is important? And really what that comes down to is there's a limited amount of resources at the moon, but in those near earth objects that Catalina had discovered were all in earth, in orbit close enough to proximity to earth to be able to go access. Um, there are all the different materials that we look for on earth to go produce things. And so what that really means is if we can access those minerals, those uh, compounds and materials, that gives us an entire supply for industry and space and for enabling not just lifting things to space to go do processes. So right now there's a lot of interest in developing a lunar economy or a low earth orbit economy and having commercialization of LEO. What you're doing in that marketplace is really lifting goods to space, raw materials, and then producing something of value because you have a vacuum or because you have low gravity. And, or potentially because it's more dangerous to do it in a factory on Earth and it's simpler to protect everything in space. 
Um, but for those reasons, you're still paying the cost of lifting out of the gravity well. Once you have access and mobility in the cis lunar area, accessing those near Earth objects, that enables the whole economy to be able to then produce other goods and move everyone forward. Now, I, I think Tori has talked a lot about the journey to a $3 trillion economy. Really what that's doing is pointing out that once we have the access to fuel that enables you to access the other raw materials that are near earth, when you have access to those, you can then grow an economy that's bringing value back to earth. It's allowing you to spend more time in space, have more people do things in space. There are lots of capabilities that you bring to the marketplace when you're operating out of space. And so you end up basically jumpstarting just by having that fuel to start things going to being able to produce pharmaceuticals, human organs, um, having the widespread manufacturing that can go on in space and really moving to an environment where we no longer are reliant on scarce resources from Earth. We have all of this source of materials in space that we can leverage to go move humanity forward, not just the US, not just a single company, but all of us can be have a better life in the future because of access to all those resources. So with that, <laughs> that was a little bit faster than I intended to run through all this, but I, I did wanna close with a little bit on why we're here today, because policy and law has a really key role in how we enable access to the resources, how we control behaviors of everyone as we start to explore and exploit the natural resources that are available to us in space. Um, we're not the only power that's interested in accessing these resources and playing roles in space. And so setting up those policies and laws are gonna be critical to deconflicting how we expand out into space. And so I think that's where I'd love to see the focus today. Um, I think the other piece that I've been focused on is how do we work together as a nation and international group that are interested in, in democratization of space to really set standards and norms of behavior to influence the other players in space. Now, I also look at Ukraine and go, influencing doesn't always do it. So we need to have both sides of that equation. So with that, I look forward to the conversation ahead. Uh, and I will pass it over, Franz. John, thanks very much. John, thanks very much. Appreciate it. Um, again, we're, we're going to do quick uh, presentations for each of us, and then move into Q and A. I think, um, but uh, do want to introduce while, while the slides are being pulled up. I did turn it on. I think. Yeah, I think, and I think the lab mics were working better. So. I'm sorry. Uh, I think everybody can hear me right now. Yeah, great. There we go. That works. And PowerPoint is up. Great. I want to introduce uh, Franz van der Dock. Uh, I'm not going to read that entire title, Franz. Uh, he's a <laughs> professor of space law at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. Uh, also maintains a very active consultancy in space law in the Netherlands. Uh, I think he lives on KLM going transatlantic. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and has been one of the leaders in, in this field uh, since this deal has existed. So, uh, Franz, we're really pleased to have you here, and over to you. Thanks. Thank you for the very kind introduction, Stephen, and thanks for having me here. Um, this is going to be the only slide with a picture on it, I'm sorry, because lawyers work with words, and I thought I'd just give you the plain words of today, right? Because this is just a sort of introduction in particular for those of you who might not be too familiar with the baseline legal system applicable to property rights or resources. I'm sure Laura will have something more to add later on and then we get into the discussion. So when it comes to the Outer Space Treaty, there's basically only one clause, and that's the one that I uh, quote here, which is even coming close to saying something about resource exploitation of celestial bodies. Uh, the words are not in there except for celestial bodies. Uh, Article 2 basically tried to prevent the land grab in outer space, and as, as you see, no part of outer space, including the moon or celestial bodies, can be subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty or by any other means. Now, when it comes to the legal status of outer space, and uh, which is 
defined by Article 2. The key question is then, what does that mean for space mining, which was on nobody's mind in 1967 when the treaty was drafted, but now is a major issue. And I dare say that if you think about this at theoretical level, you can have two kinds of interpretations. One is that you say, well, outer space belongs to all of humankind. It's an international area, uh, which means that all the resources there should also belong to all of humankind, right? That's one kind of logic. The other kind of logic is that you treat it as a kind of a global commons. That is not a legal term. It's a colloquial term sort of indicating the, the international status. If you accept that kind of approach, you say that, well, it's no state can actually appropriate outer space. But they are all entitled to use the resources for their own benefit, and by proxy, if they are interested in doing so, allow their private sector to benefit from those activities as well, or to benefit from the, the freedom, I should say, as well, subject to whatever international space law dictates, which includes the requirement of uh, authorization and supervision, and preciously little more than that, which is one of the problems. But whatever international law dictates, of course, should apply to those operations by the private sector as well. Now, this is where it stood for a long time, a theoretical discussion about uh, what it would mean, theoretical, because nobody was seriously considering it, until, of course, in the 2010s, there were two US companies who were pretty gung-ho on actually going to celestial bodies. At that time, it was basically the asteroids rather than the moon, but um, the moon and asteroids, legally speaking, are in the same basket, so the same rules apply to them. This resulted in what I'm sure most of you are familiar with, a first U.S. act dealing with space exploration, uh, space mining, space resource exploitation. There was actually only a part of this act, Title IV, a very short title, called Space Resource Exploration and Utilization, which basically did three things. First of all, it recognizes the property rights of US citizens and companies over space resources after extraction on a first come first serve basis. But of course, we should always realize this applies only to disputes within the jurisdiction of the United States. A Chinese operator or a Dutch operator has nothing to do with this in principle. Second, um, of course, because the Outer Space Treaty Article 6 requires uh, authorization and supervision. This was also the kickoff point for a discussion in US Congress as to how to regulate and supervise future space mining activities, which for all I know is still going on. And the third one is probably the most interesting one. It goes back to point number one that, of course, the law itself only applies within the US and within US jurisdiction, calls upon the US president to promote the interest of the US industry, which reads to me try to convince the rest of the world that the US approach of single state um, uh, licensing is a good idea. Now, this 2015 act finally sparked some international discussion. Uh, the criticisms to summarize them as far as they were legal was on the one hand saying, well, this unilateral approach taken by the United States is against the spirit of the outer space treaty. Uh, outer space activity should be um, equitable for all human, humankind, or at least for all the countries. And in this way, you have just one country taking out all the benefits or allowing its private sector to take out all the benefits. And the other uh, agreement that was sometimes voiced was that there was this later agreement, the Moon Agreement, 1979, which was originally drafted to cope with the idea of space mining as it then started to seem to become a reality. And I'm phrasing this deliberately very carefully. Um, and at the time, the original text was agreed to by all space faring countries, but that was before ratification. And ultimately, we only have 18 states as of today recognizing this treaty as valid, and none of them are major space faring countries with the exception of Australia. The idea of the Moon Agreement, which is then uh, still put forward by criticisms from some other countries as to this unilateral US approach, were that the international regime uh, is necessary before you can actually have uh, uh, exploitation of the moon. Now, the US wasn't alone for a long time. In 2017, the country of Luxembourg uh, created a law as well, and in the interest of transparency as a consultant, I was closely involved with that, which allows private ownership over extracted resources, even more clearly, I would say, than the US law. 
It provides for a system of mission authorization for uh, ex exploitation activities in outer space, and it includes a full liability system for damage, which is, of course, one of the concerns of the rest of the community, that people will go there, mine without due regard for anybody else's interests. A third country then, two years later, again came on the horizon, which is the United Arab Emirates, and again, in the interest of transparency, I was closely involved in that law as well. And this was a much broader law, it didn't only deal with uh, resource exploitation, but it does explicitly include the possibility to authorize these kind of missions. You see a very broad, very detailed definition, including ownership, purchase, sale, train, transportation, storage, and any space building. So, if you think about the sticks, the bundle of sticks of property rights, they're all in there, right? Subject to conditions yet to be determined. The UAE law is no more than a framework for. And then meanwhile, we have a fourth country in, into the game, the Japanese Space Resources Act. In the interest of transparency, I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> um, but it does provide for a permit, uh, the need to have a permit to pursue space resource extraction activities. Um, there was already a general space activity act which requires the licensing of any space activities, which you also needed for that. And before you would ever get to that, you must provide a number of information data on what you're going to do there, presumably allowing the Japanese licensing authorities to determine whether they were okay with your intended mission or not. But now we have four countries who, by way of their national law, have indicated that they interpret Article 2 as meaning that you are allowed to have a unilateral licensing system as long as you stay within the bounds of international law. A few of the latest developments, and I'm sure we're going to come back to those uh, later on as well. There are, of course, the famous Artemis Accords, which technically speaking are not a legally binding treaty, but it includes the principle of legitimacy of space mining. So if you sign up to those, you more or less consider that the most appropriate interpretation of Article 2. It has meanwhile been accepted by the space agencies of 22, I think is the current uh, count, uh, countries. Uh, you see them listed here. Of particular interest is Australia, because Australia is also party to the Moon Agreement, which, as I said before, seems to suggest that you cannot do this without an international, uh, proper international regime. Does it mean that Australia is moving over to the US position? Might well be. A further interesting country here is Brazil, because Brazil was one of the countries that originally was most vocally opposed to the US Unilateral Act in 2015. They, they spoke about, uh, you know, violating the multilateral approach of the treaty and the spirit and things like that. And the final country that is of interest here is Saudi Arabia, because Saudi Arabia, just like Australia, has signed and ratified the Moon Agreement. So whether there is going to be a conflict between those two, we'll have to see that. We did see that sort of in reaction to the Artemis Accords, Russia and China also told us that they were going to discuss a cooperation with regard to lunar activities, presumably to allow a kind of an alternative uh, way of handling the, uh, the, the Article 2 prohibition on, on exploitation. But I have seen any, I have not seen any details, and I don't think that's just because I don't understand much Russian or Chinese. I, I don't think they have come to any substantial agreement, but we can discuss that later on perhaps. What is more interesting is that many countries have now actually signed bilateral agreements with Luxembourg and the second country in the race on these particular uh, issues of cooperating for space mining. Now, a number of countries there, the UAE and Japan and the United States are logical partners, but we also see China, which is interesting considering the above. So even while China may, politically speaking, be, be interested in you know, trying to, to put a stick in the wheel of the United States as much as it can. It has an interest in allowing unilateral licensing for space mining because the Chinese probably are going to be back up there pretty soon as well. Another country of interest is Belgium. Belgium was also originally very much worried about the, uh, the idea that one single state could move forward without the rest of the international community agreeing to that. So we do perhaps see a gradual realization that Article 2 does not, generally speaking, provide a state from licensing commercial operations. We're not there yet, politically speaking, but we might soon be. 
Last point here, Russia discussed some bilateral agreements with Luxembourg as well, although I get the impression that that was merely to try and find out what they were after, get some more information, because obviously, given it's uh, still anti-US stance also at this point, uh, this hasn't come to fruition. I leave it at that, and thank you for your kind attention. All right, uh, Lauren, you're going to take the podium. I think Aaron is going to show your slides up. Thank you, Franz. Um, uh, last but not least, Mark Montgomery, who I've known for a number of years. Laura and I are involved in some other organizations together. Uh, and uh, Laura is also a full time space lawyer, formerly at uh, federal agencies, now gone off and hung up her own shingle, um, and uh, also teaches uh, at the uh, Catholic University uh, School of Law. And so she will also do a little on space property rights, and then it'll be time for Q&A. So that's that's my alert to the audience to start getting ready. Uh, when it's time for q and I'll play traffic cop, and uh, we'll uh, take a uh, take show of hands from the audience. Uh, with that, Laura, let's hit it. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen, and thank, thank you for including me in this uh, conference. I'm really excited to be here. So um, I think I have two slides with pictures, but I'm also a lawyer, so that's it. Um, <laughs> oh, I can lie, three. So, you know, there's, there's three different obvious contexts in which to think about property rights in space. One is objects, and there's pretty much no controversy over the fact that if you put an object in space, it's yours. No one's going to start quoting the treaty at you to the contrary. And there's plenty of domestic law to cover those any issues in that context. Mining has just been covered by Franz very ably, and we know where the status of that stands. I'm going to get out there a little bit ahead and talk about land, which is, you know, very, very interesting, mostly in the context of the Outer Space Treaty. And what I'd like to suggest in that regard is that we do have room to maneuver legally if we have the policy impetus to do so, because the law will let you. So, here we have our sun-drenched lunar real estate. In its defense, I will say that it's also cold. But still, people will want to go there and use it. And so maybe we need to think, I'm not saying we should go rush out and pass any laws. I just want to be really clear about that. This is my fine print. We need to start thinking, however, because if we're planning, it's always good to start thinking, well, what it will it be like later? And what will I wish I had or hadn't said or had or hadn't done. So what are the policy considerations in favor of recognizing private property rights in land out in space? When I say land, I mean the moon and other celestial bodies. I have no opinions about um, what some folks call void space, you know, interplanetary space. And, uh, you know, I, I can only think about so many things at once. And so land it is. Now, one of the things that we hear from economists is that clear and recognized freely transferable property rights lie at the heart of prosperity. But we want prosperity in space, so maybe we should think about it there. The Chilean economist Hernando de Soto said that absent legally recognized rights to buy, own, and sell titled property, it is difficult, if not impossible, to get a loan for that to improve it, to mine it, to drill for minerals on it, or to sell the proceeds of any of those activity. Now, this is because property rights provide transparency. If you have a nice fence between you and your neighbor, you know what's his, you know what's yours. And you don't get into unproductive squabbles over whether you know they're, they should stop spraying pesticides right on your plants. And so um, transparency is useful in other contexts besides you and your neighbor. It also provides incentives, many of which um, Professor DeSoto listed above, because if you know that you get to keep all the things you've worked on, you are more likely to work on it. The um, reliance and the ability to plan matters. If you think that everything you've been doing for the past 10 years is going to be changed or taken from you, you might, again, be disincentivized. And for policymakers in the United States, it is important to think about 
whether we want to leverage the private sector. There's been a lot of work done very ably by NASA and other government agencies in space, but there's a whole slew of money out there that could also be used to foster the development of space. And investors like those things, the transparency, the reliability, the ability to plan. So if we recognize private property in space, we could very likely unleash a whole lot of money for folks to go ahead and do the work we want them to do. We would avoid the uncertainty of changing administrations and congressional priorities. We would avoid embedding errors between the, because the markets can correct ways in ways that legislation can't seem to. I speak as a former regulatory attorney with the FAA, and let me tell you, it is super hard to change a regulation, and it is super harder to change a law passed by Congress. So keep that in mind. Markets are slow, but they do correct eventually. You know, all that creative destruction does happen. It's not fun, but it's useful. Now, I said that we can do this legally under the Outer Space Treaty. So I'm going to look at several arguments as to why we cannot and explain why they are not necessarily correct. Sometimes I say because they're wrong, but I think Franz is going to disagree with me. So I'm trying to like soft pedal this. <laughs> but, uh, so space is a commons. One thing I see repeatedly in um, articles and law reviews and elsewhere is that space is the province of all mankind. That means it's a commons. But professors um, Henry Herzfeld and Christopher Johnson of GW and Georgetown and Brian Whedon of the Secure World Foundation wrote a great article that I would recommend to all of you pointing out that it isn't space that is the province of all mankind. It's, it's exploration and use. We have to wade our way through all the commas up there. And then we can say, oh, wait, it's the exploration and use that is the province of all mankind. And we do have to wade our way through all the commas because when courts interpret law, and they do tend to be the last word on interpretations of law, unless Congress comes, steps in, and overturns their rulings, um, you have to read the words. Pretend it's a computer code. I know that's hard. They're vague, these words. But you do have to read the words and ascribe to them their ordinary meaning when you are interpreting them. And so when it says the exploration and use of outer space shall be the province of all mankind, that's what it says. It doesn't say something else. You don't get to add words or take words out. So that's the first argument. Next, we have um, Article 2, which Franz touched on in the mining context. And I would suggest here that a reading of the plain language, if we notice that it says it, outer space is not subject to national appropriation, that word national means something. It is not subject to appropriation by nation states. So it is silent about the private sector. In other words, they didn't talk about it, therefore it doesn't apply. Article six also, also from the outer space treaty says that um, states' parties shall bear international responsibility for their national activities in outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, whether such activities are carried on by governmental agencies or by non-governmental entities, the private sector, and for assuring that those activities are carried on in conformity with the treaty. So the court conformity argument would say that okay, if nation states can't own property or exercise sovereignty, neither can private parties. But I would suggest that we have another way of looking at that. We can, you know, the courts do require us to read treaties as well as laws so that they make sense and apply to something. And here we would say, well, the private sector can't act as a front for a nation state. So maybe countries that have state-owned enterprises shouldn't be allowed to own property on the moon or otherwise in outer space, <clears throat> China. Or, um, but if the, if, uh, if the government doesn't own the corporation or have an ownership interest in it, then there is no need to worry about conformity because, well, Article 2 applies to nation states. 
Then we also have a responsibility argument that says, well, um, if uh, the United States is responsible for its citizens and it can't own land in outer space and neither can its citizens. But I would just suggest that there's um, plenty of counter examples for that. For instance, state governments recognize title transfers between people. You know, if I sell my house to someone down the road, government doesn't own it, yet it can still, you know, recognize that exchange. States can't get married, but they can issue marriage licenses every day. Excuse me, I have rushed ahead here. This is, I'm talking about the last argument. There's two slides in front of me, but there's only one slide in front of you guys. So. Um, the final argument rests on the notion that states can't grant what they don't have. And so because you know, states can't own land, they can't recognize someone else's ownership. But you can recognize what you don't have, as I just mentioned in those two art examples. You can recognize title transfers of land you don't own, and states can't get married, but they issue marriage licenses every day. Now, this is like the fun part. This is a thought experiment. And let's say that you know my, my, um, my interesting arguments were to prevail. And it was decided that, yes, indeed, private entities can own land in outer space. How would you go about figuring out whether someone can own that land? Because lots of people, you know, want, there's that great case of the, the, of the fellow claiming an asteroid. And just because you can look at it, just because you can see it through a telescope, doesn't mean that you have claimed it. Uh, so what if you send a robot? What if you land a rocket? Do you own it? What if you quantify it? Oh, wait, that's a different topic. Um, so I'd like to suggest that we at least explore whether elements of adverse possession might work here. Now, it is, what is that adverse possession? I always say, well, squatters' rights are a form of adverse possession. Easements are a form of adverse possession. Franz referenced the bundle of sticks and property rights. You know, you can own it or you can lease it. Those are all different types of property rights. Um, this is a method of acquisition to title, but to real property type possession for a statutory period, in other words, a length of time under certain conditions. This is something that comes to us from the Middle Ages, which is a brutal time full of violent people constantly taking each other's stuff away from them. And this, this uh, approach developed then. So if it can come through that, I think we might be able to, to use it going into the future because it is very, very general principles. It looks at whether if you've taken someone else's land, Let's say I go plant a garden in my neighbor's front yard. And he just glares at me in a very passive aggressive way. And I think the state of Maryland has a 15 year statute of limitations. And every year I go do that vegetable bed. And every year he does nothing. After 15 years, if I satisfy all these other conditions, it will be mine, that little 15 by 20 foot plot. Um, I haven't done this just so you know. Uh, even though there's this vivid imagination of it. So it has to be actual, open. He has to know. I have to be pretty blatant about it. I can't let him plant some tomatoes in it too. So it has to be exclusive. And there's got to be someone it's hostile to. Now, one of the reasons for this being a good approach is the... Um, it recognizes effort, work, and productive use of the land. It settles claims between the true owner, my poor neighbor, and oh, but only if it's fair. Like if he's just done nothing, at a certain point, I start expecting I get to use it. It's almost like he's granted me permission, even though he hasn't. Um, but it's almost like that. And in space, it will help encourage investment if people know that, okay, after 20 years, I get to say it's mine. And maybe we, for space, because space is super hard, we want to make the time period shorter, but that's something that can just be decided. Um, it calms worries. It could enhance that productivity and allow people to leverage their land as collateral, get mortgages on it, go invest in more, more space activities. Now, I don't know that we want to use all of those elements from that list. For instance, 
or whether um, you are adverse or hostile to someone, you know, me and my neighbor, I'm hostile to him, uh, because there's no sovereignty. And right now, and I always like to think of these in two parts, the immediate future and the far term future. In the, immediate future, in the immediate future, there's no one there for us to go like, you know, take their land and plant something in the corner of their yard. So there's not really much in the way of adversity or hostility. Therefore, I think we should ignore that one. That's just sort of a, a notional proposition. However, when, um, when you go look at cases from the uh, early 20th century in the United States, and you see people pouring in on each other's property in different states, and you see how the state's courts dealt with it, you can see that some of these principles might apply, but we should be careful about it because they might be um, a little tricky. So for instance, there was a, a, a situation where there were two neighbors and one fellow found an entrance to an amazing cave underground, sort of like the Luray Caverns, but in the West. And um, he charged admin admission to it and didn't let people come in without a ticket or his explicit permissions, was very exclusive use. He put out all sorts of advertisements, in newspapers and billboards and flyers around town so that people would come and pay to visit his cave. And so that was very, you know, arguably open and notorious. And, um, and he controlled it, so he had possession. But it turned out that part of the cave was under his, his neighbor's land. And when the neighbors sued to say, look, this is under my land, so part of it's mine, and I want to start getting some of those proceeds from those ticket sales, the court ultimately found in, front, in favor of the neighbor who had for years never complained. He never complained because he didn't know. It was too hard, the court said, to know whether those caves were there until you did some sort of meticulous survey or with math that I don't understand. And so then, um, when we're looking at the moon, let's say, which has those cool, intriguing lunar latitudes, or maybe someone might want to set up um, residential facilities or, or something else, uh, there's a question, are they secret or open? Well, you might say, well, that was really early in the 20th century. We have way better instruments now. We're also gonna have much more incentives. So whether someone is tunneling under your property or has found another existing tunnel might be a question that, that would come out differently because everyone's got, you know, seismography and all sorts of instrumentation to help them detect these different, um, tunnels or activity under your property. So maybe it would be open and notorious, even though it wasn't a hundred years ago. The other big, the other big, the other really big element in adverse possession is possession. So I'm not like setting up a house in my neighbor's yard, but I am working, I'm working that vegetable plot every year. And um, and so I thought, I, one of the things, since I don't remember my law school class in adverse possession very well, was, well, do people need to be there? You know, do you have to, do you have to be there to possess it? Because what if someone puts a bunch of robots on the moon? Would that help towards possession? And then I found this great Texas um, cattle grazing case where one rancher was constantly sending his cows into someone else's territory, property, letting them eat all the pasture and then bringing them back. And he wanted to say, that's mine because that guy sat on his rights for X number of years. And so um, it's like, oh, and the court was like, yeah, that can happen. In this instance, it didn't for other reasons, but you can, you can claim possession of someone else's land with your cattle. Well, if you can do it with cattle, maybe you can do it with robots. So that's something, that's something to consider. I'm gonna skip the weed cutting because that would be getting in the weeds. Um, the, uh, the last one is your possession has to be continuous. Now, obviously the grazing season comes and goes. Um, so it, you have to be um, continuous for the purpose for which you are using the land. And I've seen cases where flooding you know, kind of stops the clock against the uh, adverse possessor. In other words, Yes, I would have brought my cattle here had the river not flooded. And the court says, okay, you still get 
that you're counting towards you because you know you, you can't do anything about this flood. So if we were to apply these principles on the moon and start thinking, well, is lunar night an act of nature like flooding? Um, or should we start recognizing that you know batteries can can keep someone operating and exercising dominion over the land on the moon? Because you could set up scenarios like, well, he was really active for two weeks, but then he stops, so it's not continuous. But if we say we have to recognize the physical properties of the of the way the moon's night and day work, then maybe we would say, yeah, we're going to recognize that as continuous. But each of these little questions will be answered in a very um, context-dependent way. And, but nonetheless, we can still look to these very broad principles to help guide our analysis. And I think they're as good a starting place as any. And I think we should think about them. Now, everyone always wants to know about enforceability. Steve is gesturing me to wrap it up. So it could be done. It, you can solve these problems by courts in different states um, or an international agreement or organic growth, or just a bunch of neighbors could agree with each other. We're gonna look at it this way and have a truly organic development of the law. I've written all of my little scenarios up on my blog if you are interested in reading more. And thank you very much. Um, we can probably turn the slides off, I think. I think we're done with slides for a bit. Um, we're going to do some q and I've, I've got a couple that were triggered by the conversation, but I'll take moderator's privilege and start. Um, uh, John, um, the, the, the title of our day here is The Future is Almost Now. You used that on your slides. Um, as far as I can tell, the only thing that anyone's ever made any money at in space is bringing back photons, whether it's bringing back images or bringing back telecommunications or bringing back signals of some sort. Mm -hmm. when, when does somebody take a physical something, whether it's a liter of water or a chunk of iron ore or something tangible and sell that? How, how far away is that future? So I actually think that the future for bringing products down from low Earth orbit is relatively near. Mm -hmm. um, there are companies that are out there looking at, they've already done technology demonstrations for making the high quality fiber optics mm -hmm. up at the space station. There's other processes that are being explored in space, sta space station today that I think we'll be able to get to market fairly quickly. Um, likely the next hurdle for that is how do they bring the product cost effectively back down? Um, right now, the only real path is through one of the vehicles that is returning from space station today. Mm -hmm. um, one of the technologies that we're working with NASA on is a hypersonic inflatable aerodynamic decelerator, mm -hmm. uh, which basically is just a, a giant uh, inflated heat shield. Okay. Um, we want to use it for bringing the engines back to be able to do reuse of the high price part of the launch system. But that also has benefit for those producers in low Earth orbit to bring product back down at their leisure, whenever they wish to bring it back to Earth and have a landing zone for that that they can target. Um, are you, are you going to sell rides on that? Pardon? Are you going to sell rides on that? Uh, it would to, to definitely be an e-ticket. Uh, <laughs> but to answer the, the true question, yes, those are intended for human use as well in the cool. future. Cool. Uh, that's NASA's roadmap for Mars. Um, I think from a, a lunar resources that's further out, I think the next step is going to be, um, again, data, but it's going to be data around uh, locating resources, doing demonstrations of extraction techniques for resource, for how do you pull something out of the ground and create a raw material or a pure material, mm -hmm. uh, something that would be useful. In situ re resource utilization would be another where you could take some of that lunar regolith and produce something. Mm -hmm. uh, and then have a structure on the moon that is made of moon materials that's likely to occur before you try and return something of value back to Earth. I think all of those, so you're still talking within the next five to 10 years. Okay, that's, that is almost now. That's very mm -hmm. cool. cool. Um, 
I, I'm gonna I'm gonna trigger the mud wrestling portion of our panel uh, <laughs> between Franz and Laura. Um, I think we already touched on a little bit of the uh, differences there. Uh, I am not a lawyer. I don't play one on television. Uh, but the very naive way in which I explain some of the the uh, dis disagreement over uh, property rights uh, is that because Article Two is silent uh, on the issue of private entities being able to declare property rights in space resources, uh, that there is an interpretation that because it is silent, it is therefore forbidden because it's not permitted. Uh, and then there's the, the interpretation, which is because it's silent, it is therefore obviously permissible because it is not forbidden. Um, and in, in, in a very simplistic way, that's kind of the American versus the European distinction, all those exceptions on both sides. But um, Franz, you, you go first. What, what, what are your thoughts on, on what Laura said about uh, Article 2 allowing private entities to declare ownership? Well, I thought I think it was a very interesting uh, plea for uh, lay referenda for law to be made. Okay. Although I'm wondering whether the picture painted, you know, if the government leaves it to the private sector to give you properties, that would almost sound like the Wild West was a glorious, uh, you know, very peaceful element of U.S. past. But that, that's my buy. I think, as as uh, an analysis of the current law, uh, the Lex Lata, I have some major problems with it. Um, first of all, the, the first part of the argument reminds me that it was exactly the same argument that Dennis Holt uh, used to claim property on the moon and became a millionaire with selling it to everyone else. And the idea that Article 2 uh, only refers to national appropriation, even though it adds sense, all sorts of other elements and not about private appropriation, that was his first element, argument as well. Uh, and I think there are a couple of reasons why that fails. First of all, it's nice to say Article 2 has to be read as it says, but then you also have to add Article 6, which has also to be read what it says which means that any private activity in our space is equated with uh, state activity, which already means that a private activity in terms of uh, handling the uh, uh, so-called property on the moon would again immediately become a state property and as a consequence of Article 2, therefore would be included in national appropriation. So the word national appropriation includes private activities already because every private activity is directly attributed to a state. But there's a more profound, and this is also part of the analysis that the International Institute of Space Law, which is, I dare say, the most authoritative body of space law is around the world, has already stated in a couple of statements. While Article 2 on the face of it may suggest that private uh, appropriation is left outside of the discussion, if you think about it, private appropriation, the, 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 the way in which a private person can obtain ownership over land is very much dependent upon national law. Mm -hmm. And the laws in the United States about how somebody can get private property over land are totally different from the laws in the Netherlands, from the laws in China, from the laws in Russia. And Article 2 says the moon or any celestial body is neither Russia or US or the Netherlands, so no rules on how to obtain private property in outer space in, in the United States can be implemented on the moon as if the moon was part of the United States. And that's also my problem with the whole analysis of adverse uh, adverse uh, possession and things like that. You you not accidentally quoted only US courts decisions, which is fine for the US, but as I said earlier, neither a Chinese operator nor a Dutch operator would have anything to do with that. So if it's a plea for let's use this concept at the international level for creating something that goes further than we currently have, that's fine. The Outer Space Treaty is not written in stone. Uh, if the world community agrees that we should change Article 2, then that's fine. But I think under the current, uh, under the current uh, analysis, you cannot argue that the US can apply its particular national, whether it's federal or state laws, uh, common law or whatever, to the moon as if it was US territory. Because uh, again, uh, the ways in which private persons can own territory and what the rights and obligations of the government are, and you talked about the, the CAVE case. Uh, well, different countries have different tax on what it means that if I own a piece of land and I strike oil, whether that oil belongs to me or to the government. 
whether I find an artifact of 2000 years ago, whether it belongs to me or whether it belongs to the government. So everything depends upon how the territory is qualified. Um, I'm also not so sure that you actually need possession of the area in order to allow beneficial exploitation. We've seen examples all, uh, elsewhere as well. Uh, think about the use of orbital slots for satellites. Mm -hmm. uh, a trillion dollar business has been able to flourish without anyone ever claiming that a particular orbit or orbital slot is uh, belonging to a particular country and that that particular country has the uh, right to apply its ownership rules to that particular slot. And even though there are conflicts and it's a far from perfect system, I wouldn't, I wouldn't consider it an automatic given that you need that. It, it's of course open-ended discussion whether you think it's better or not, but I really want to make this distinction between the law as it is and the law as it perhaps should be. Thank you. Councillor. So um, I do think that the, uh, the ITU's system for orbital slots is, is workable mm -hmm. and, and very useful and it is done very well. Does your mic on? Just making sure. Um, yes. Okay, great. But if we want to optimize, if we want that flood of investment based on certainty and the ability to long range plan, I think we do want to recognize property rights. So that's, you know, to the policy side of things. Um, on the uh, Article 6 arguments, I would like to point out that uh, we do in the United States say that if it's not forbidden, it's allowed. And reading the plain language, which is what we're supposed to do, it forbids national appropriation. Then when we turn to the Article 6 provisions where the United States is um, internationally responsible and um, everyone must operate in conformity with the treaty, we, we have, I have to point out that is not saying that we are somehow metaphysically one. You, US citizens are not part of the US government and vice versa. If that were the case, I think, you know, the government would be paying my mortgage, but it isn't, we are not <laughs> one. So we need, to, we need to keep in mind that although the US is responsible, in other words, it has to pay damages if a citizen is harmed somewhere in outer space, perhaps, um, I still have that government lawyer side of me that never wants to admit to, to US government liability for anything. Um, but uh, that's just about who's paying money. And then on the conformity side, I, I would like to say that what we one way we can look at it if we want to is to say that conformity applies to the exact language. So, okay, your, your conformity argument is no that, that the uh, citizens must also abide by the treaty's provisions. But if the treaty's provisions applies to the state, then it doesn't apply to the citizen. The one instance I can think of, and perhaps others may come up with other examples, is that the um, a state-owned enterprise would be such a non-governmental entity, but it would still not be allowed to own property. And there you have a, a way of interpreting the treaty and giving it effect without having to uh, pursue a poorer policy path than otherwise. So, so, so Sandia National Labs can't own property on the moon, but ULA could. Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, I've, I've got some more questions, but there's a whole, lot, a whole bunch of smart people in this room. Uh, I think yours, I didn't even ask for hands yet, but yours was up. So you, I will be asking for hands, but you're, you're first. Uh, hi, good morning, everybody. And, and, and please, uh, I think there's a mic to be run around. Uh, please announce yourself, name, affiliation, and use the mic. Uh, Chris Johnson, uh, Secure World Foundation. Thank you so much for the presentations and for the comments. Um, my question is for Professor Montgomery, and it's dealing with the, that application, that understanding of Article Two. If your line of reasoning says that, hey, put it a little bit higher. Oh, sir. Oh, okay. Ah, it seems better. really loud to me, but nope, okay. It's good. This is good. Okay. So, if your line of reasoning about Article Two is that it addresses state behavior and it prohibits states from appropriating celestial bodies or subsections thereof, but it says nothing about private actors, and so private actors are free to make claims on um, appropriation. 
Would you also apply, let's, let's look two articles later to Article 4, which prohibits states from placing nuclear weapons or, or other weapons of mass destruction in outer space. By your line of reasoning, private actors, would, would you say that they're permitted to place nuclear weapons in outer space? Well, I would ask the gentleman from the military that question. <laughs> it, is, it is not something, um, I, of course we don't want them to, but it, it, it did not get addressed. And so the treaty is silent. I mean, when, that, you, when you look at Supreme Court cases, of, I mean, no one likes that answer, but it, it is silent on that one. You look at Supreme Court cases, they don't add language to, to, the, uh, to the provisions of, of laws and treaties. So, so legally speaking, you would agree that they could do it because the language is silent, and if it's not prohibited, it's allowed. Under domestic law. Uh, yeah, oh, I'm I, talking about Article right, 4. Right. Yeah. Well, but I, I think the underlying assumption was that individuals are not allowed to have nuclear weapons. Period. Yeah. There's, there's, other, there's, 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 there's other laws. There's but other laws that take care of that. Is, is there a U.S. law which prohibits? Uh... I, this is this is actually relevant because one of our future technologies is nuclear thermal right. propulsion. Right. 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 So if I have an upper stage, am I now prohibited from using NTP to maneuver in space because of the nuclear? Aspects, it says weapon, right? so right. No, yeah. I know, but, but yeah, mm -hmm. but everything is a, a brick is a weapon. Right? <laughs> uh -huh. That's where I was going. Right. So, so yes, yeah, so the the thing is, you know, when you enter into agreements, especially when you do it in the 1960s, you might not think of everything, and you might need a new agreement. And but, but does that then also not apply to Article Two? Because in 1967, nobody thought about. Someone like Dennis Hope trying to claim parts of the Oh, yes. Wall. I'm sorry. I forgot to, make, to address him. Um, I didn't write it down. Uh, so, so, um, so, Dennis Hope claiming the moon and selling plots of land. I actually own one of those acres. But it's um, you, 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 you don't. I know. She owns the acres. She owns the piece of paper. She owns the piece of paper. It's a piece of paper. Big, big piece of paper. It's a very pretty piece of paper. Yeah. At the bottom of it, it says this is uh, provided for entertainment purposes only. So he is not actually making a claim of ownership. And, the, and, and he's an example of why we would want to think about having better principles at work. And those better principles would um, perhaps include elements of adverse possession, and it could be agreed to internationally or nation by nation, like the um, after the mineral resource uh, laws that, that Franz has worked on. But it could all. But you can't let Dennis hope. You know, you can't believe him for one thing, and he does have his disclaimer, so he's not exercising and fraud. But the, um, the disclaimer came he off was, the complaints. He uh, would certainly uh, fail <laughs> under any of the adverse possession. But I do want to push back a little bit on the notion that they would not have had any concept of private use or private ownership, because if you look back at science fiction, if you look at the movies. A lot of those were predicated on individuals doing moon, moon shots, right? So it was in the public imagination that there would be people, not just nation states, entering the domain. And that is why the Soviet Union at the time insisted on Article 6, uh, uh, allocating the responsibility for anything the private sector or private entities does mm -hmm. in the space to. Uh, to the government because they were very worried in, in their view of the U.S. The private sector was just another, you know, hidden tool for the U.S. to establish dominance in the world. That's what the communist world feels. So they wanted to make absolutely sure that they would never have to deal with any private space activities. They could directly talk to the United States about that. And that's what the treaty says, Article well, 6. Well, it says responsible. Yeah. And it says conformity, yes. but it doesn't right. say we have to achieve metaphysical union with each other. No, but, no, but that, that was your point, but nobody agrees, nobody suggests that there was metaphysical union. It is for the purpose of the treaty. The attribution. Attribution. Yeah. That happens more often. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there are things that individual persons do, which under general international law cannot be attributed to a state. Mm -hmm. um, there's no state responsibility for the Dutch state if I start shooting around and killing people here. That's not a violation of by the Netherlands. That's, that's my personal crime. Right. 
Um, but in space, Article Six makes that a different different solution. Doesn't mean that uh, that, uh, that that everything I do is now attributable to the Dutch government. But if I do something in outer space, it is. That's the way Article Six is written. But it's attributable to the government in the sense of the government might have to pay. No, is responsibility not... doesn't talk about payment. That's the liability article. Responsibility is well, precisely about conformity. As Article 6 literally says, it's about conformity with the provisions of the present treaty, which is the Outer Space Treaty. And given that the Outer Space Treaty is kind of the Magna Carta for Outer Space on which the rest of space law is built, the proxy argument is that by that, and it includes to Article 3 all of general international law to the extent not deviating from space law. I hope I'm not make too long a sentence with too many commas here. Right? You tell me that I can start all over. Semicolons. <laughs> semicolons, okay. Um, but, but the idea is, in, in other words, the, the provision that talks about, Article 6 talks about responsibility for conformity with the treaty is generally interpreted as ensuring conformity with international law applicable to outer space. That would be based in those terms. Well, I, I have talked to many State Department lawyers who tried to convince me that international responsibility did mean liability. And when you look at the liability <laughs> convention, well, it says- I'm sorry, if says, you want to- When you look at the liability convention, it has you know the whole launching state tests for whether someone is liable, the country is liable for its citizens. But one of the prongs is looking back to some of what you're responsible for. I'm so sorry, if you insist. So what I'm saying is you can read it the way you, you are suggesting, but you can, although even there I, I have problems with the attribution, but you can also read it another way if we want to. And because the International Institute of Space Law is not a court, we don't actually have a governing body that says, mm -hmm. This is the law. This is how we must read the vague and confusing language with all the commas of the Outer Space Treaty. No, that's true, but it's best we have. And I also want to point out that you can't cherry pick. You can't say Article 2. I want to read the literal meaning of the words. So private appropriation is applicable. This is not mentioned there. And when it comes to Article 6, I don't want to read the literal words. I want to interpret responsibility as, as if it means liability, whether there is a separate article which uses that separate word. If they would have meant liability in Article 6, they should have written it there. That's the same analysis but, so, applicable to Article 2. So, and there are profound, again, the liability is, is in Article 7 is clearly talking about compensation for damage. That's what the Liability Convention is elaborating on. But Article 6... <laughs> just refers to conformity, which is a different thing. And it may, of course, involve, uh, involve damage sure. uh, where there's an overlap, but it focuses on an illegal, what they call international law act. Right, okay. so uh, can uh, I just uh, respond uh, to the response? La la last response to the response to the response. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so the word responsibility is, first of all, a word I never let my the folks in the office of commercial space put in their regulations because it's so annoying as we are seeing <laughs> um because what does it mean and some people think it means libel like people other people i've talked to because i've made your arguments before um but it also it means i'm going to do it i'm going to i'm going to take care of it and i think that's the sense in which you are referring to it as and that is a perfectly valid interpretation of responsibility there, but it means they're going to go supervise and authorize, they're going to, the, the, the signatory state is going to go do a bunch of things, including ensuring conformity. And so even, even with that, it doesn't result in the attribution or this, uh, like what, what one can do, the other can't, because you still have to read the plain language. So if I say, okay, I, Laura Montgomery, must operate in conformity with the treaty. Well, I can't become a nation state and appropriate outer space because the plain language of two still says that. So, you know, we have to sort through it all. Let, let me uh, let me chase that, and then I see at least one hand in the audience, maybe more over here to two. Um, I think as, as, as a tourist in this area, uh, I think it's fascinating that uh, I, I did a word count on the outer space treaty. It's, it's, it's a few hundred words. It, it's not a long document. It's just on a page. Uh, I think it's fascinating that a few hundred words written by some very smart people uh, 55 years ago, this is the 50th anniversary of the OST, uh, can, can lead to such uh, dramatic uh, differences in interpretation. It's, uh, it's, it's fascinating. I do think that is one of the reasons 
uh, why this country, I think both of you are saying we, we need additional clarification. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we issued the Armas reports. Um, and I didn't see a lot on the slides about Armas. Uh, I'm, I'm curious is, you know, does that fix the problem? Or I think Franz, you said at one point, Armas and Armas are not, are not international law. Well, mm -hmm. what, what would make them international law? That's, that's a great point. I think the fact that they are not international law as such, they are not a treaty in the legal sense of the word, doesn't mean that they have any legal value, and certainly not in the future. And this goes a little bit to probably what Laura is hoping for, a, what you could almost call a coalition building of like-minded states. If the Artemis Accords draw more and more parties to it, which then basically agree to what it says, mm -hmm. At some point in the future, you could make the argument that this has become customary international law. It still doesn't make it technically into a treaty, but it certainly solves the issue. It's more like by an incremental way. And treaties, of course, black letter law is very clear, even though we can argue and lawyers can always argue about things. You know, if you have two lawyers in the room, you've got three different opinions. But uh, I mean, you know, that, that is always the issue, but it is at least. You, you just then argue about the, what the law says. Customary international law is a much more fluid phenomenon whereby you start by something which at that point is totally unclear whether it's law or not. And then you start realizing that more and more states are following the same path and the same scenario. And at some point in time, it becomes very hard to argue that you're still entitled to do something different. And that, that is where the Artemis Accords may come in. And I think it's very prudent of, the, of, of NASA to start with such a low level of, of legal uh, ambition, if you want to put it that way, because that allows other states also in the process, and also NASA itself, by the way, to see whether what they originally proposed is working. So suppose that Laura, uh, Laura's economic analysis, and so it's not lawyer, it's an economist theory, is correct. <laughs> Then in the in the process of developing the lunar gateway and the lunar settlements and things like that, NASA and the other parties will come to the agreement that uh, gradually we need something like Laura proposes, and then the the, the Artemis courts are all about uh, uh, you know ongoing development and implementation, and that will be the implementation. I'm not saying that's the only way it can go because it depends upon both issues, but it allows for a gradual development of becoming aware of what it means to follow these principles. So, so to use Laura's language, the Artemis Accords are the way that we're going to take adverse possession of the United States Treaty. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me got think it. about that. <laughs> we've, got a, we've got a 10 minute warning and the gentleman with the microphone has been waiting for a while. So that's it. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm Jonathan Daigle with the National Space Society. Uh, I would like you to address, uh, I don't know, this is not for anybody in particular, so, so to, to what, what degree could Antarctica be an analog for ownership of property in space? And secondly, are there examples of property that is that are that is owned on the earth that is not subject to sovereign authority? And, and, and I'm gonna use moderator privilege. We want to make these quick answers because we've got several hands up in eight minutes. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, the, the answer is yes. There are, for example, oil platforms on the high seas which are owned by the operator because the law of the sea convention clearly recognizes the rights to do that. Uh, Antarctica is a very interesting example and has often been used as a reference because uh, many states, but not all, that's the difference with outer space, many states do claim that Antarctica is also not subject to national sovereignty. There are some states which claim part of the sovereignty. Now, interestingly enough, to cut a long story short in view of the time, these claims have been frozen, first of all, in 1959, literally, <laughs> some states like Argentina and Chile who claim a pie, they are still formally entitled to claim that part. And the other states, including the United States, who says no, it's every, man, every man's land, are still entitled to do that. What you see happening in reality in Antarctica is a large number of follow-on treaties, which all these states agree to, including the states which claim part of Antarctica, which have limited so much the sovereign discretion of Argentina, to take that example, to determine on its pie-shaped part what it wants to do, that the claim doesn't mean that much anymore. I guess a, a quick and I wanted to make was, we've been talking a lot about property rights and the ITU and the slots and spectrum, if you go that path too. 
I think there's another piece of it in that in order to be able to extract those resources, you need access to line of sight for power from solar radiation. And so then there's a whole other dynamic of ensuring access, ensuring freedom of navigation for your delivery and deployment of capabilities that need to be enshrined as well. So it's property rights as part, and then there's a whole other piece of if I'm doing something on the surface, what about any resources underneath of those separated as different commodities that are allocated to different entities and how we handle all that. But I, I just wanted to reflect that there is that added layer of complexity for the domain we're talking about. Good point. I've lost track of the mic. Yep, yeah, there we go. And then Tim will be next. Yeah, my name is David Silver. I'm with Silver Spaceport. And, you know, I can appreciate the speaker's views on possession of land on the moon, uh, but it's all going to come down to force and it's going to come down to who gets there first and who's going to control the area. I mean, you know, we get United States, we go to a foreign country, a uh, foreign uh, uh, planet, you know, who's going to have the force to keep that planet under control? If you don't have control of that planet, you don't have control. I mean, you're, you're talking about these treaties and this signing and that signing, great. But you go to Jupiter, who's ever in Jupiter is going to control Jupiter. If you don't have a spaceship to get there, how are you going to control it? If Elon Musk wants to send a spaceship to Mars and he's on Mars and he's controlling Mars, how is the United States going to go there and control Mars? They're going to go to Elon and say, Mr. Musk, can we control Mars? No, he, he's going to control Mars. He could say, we'll have an agreement with you, but who's ever there is going to be there. Adverse possession. I've got 35 years in the real estate industry. You talk about adverse possession, grazing rights. I've seen adverse possession on 100,000 acres of land. Did that land go over to the people? No, it did not. I, I got to actually turn it into a question, or we're going to have to move on. Yes, sir. So go ahead. All right. Is there, is there a question there? Or? No, I just wanted okay. to make some comments. And, 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 and look, I sympathize with your statement. There's an argument that until you put a 19 year old with a rifle, you don't know. I get it. Uh, I, I hope we don't do it that way in space, but but there's there's a strong argument there. I want to go ahead and let Tim uh, speak. My question got asked. So, I'll make a comment if there's not another question, but if there's another question, I'll leave it for that. Go ahead. Okay, my, my comment was actually to this comment, which is that I think there, Antarctica does provide an example because we did have military there. Many countries had military in Antarctica, and the Antarctic Treaty basically was a way to say, okay, let's not decide this militarily. Is that going to happen in space or not? Fair point. Fair point. Comments or questions on that? I, I briefly like to react if I, if I may. Sure. Uh, first of all, I think these planets are way too large to be controlled by anyone at the current stage. So it's not like you can control two per in one go. <laughs> uh, so there's room for more, which then gets us back to the, the point that Laura makes. And uh, we should still make the distinction in actual operations between Elon Musk and the US government, partly thanks to the work that Laura has done with the FAA for many years. Elon Musk can only go there once he got the permit from the US government. And if the US government doesn't agree to what he's planning on doing there, bad luck for him. So it doesn't mean that we can, uh, it is true that in the international community, uh, the more powerful you are, the more you can get away with violating international law. I mean, look at what Russia is doing in Ukraine right now. If Russia wouldn't have nuclear weapons or would be such a powerful state, it would have long ago been cut down. Look at, compare it to what Iraq did in Kuwait many years. So I do agree with you there, but would then asking the question from the other end, does it mean that we should simply say, well, the outer space is a lawless, well, West, that goes also back to your point that there is still some relevance to the treaty. And certainly treaties do not keep everyone from bad behavior. And unfortunately, we can't punish all the bad behavior, but it's the best we have. The fact that many killings go and so on and so or even occur at full stop. Does anyone in this room seriously want to say, well, let's get rid of the prohibition to kill someone in, in criminal law? I don't think that's the right way. And I'm sort of 
supercharging it. I'm sure that's yeah. not what you meant, but well, just, just to point the picture. I want to do one, one last row of questions. We we're in our two minute morning. Um, I, I've avoided having you know one question to each of the panelists, but for this one, I, I do want to do exactly that. I'll do it in this order, John, to be oh. first. Uh, we, we are at the 55th anniversary of the Outer Space Treaty. Uh, 55 years from now, will the Outer Space Treaty still be in effect? And if not, what replaces it? Wow. Um, so I, I think most likely what will replace it, and the short answer is I think it will still be in effect with some modification, um, but I think it will be superseded by rules of whoever the governing bodies are for the people that are living and working in space. Um, I think 50 years from now, we will have thousands of humans that are out off of Earth and may come back for a vacation, but they're day-to-day -day existence will be in space. And so it's going to be a very different, I think one of the comments Sandy Magnus made to me was when she was up at the space station, she was standing on the ceiling, not thinking about it, doing some task, and then looked down and saw the screw in the floor and it just altered her whole perspective. <laughs> um, and I think once we have people that are living and working in space, that same alteration is going to occur around the laws that govern their behavior. Great answer, thanks. I will basically agree with that. Uh, and I just add one point that even in this country, when there was an administration which was, you know, clearly not interested in international cooperation and international law and, and was, was all about, you know, purely unilateral um, effects, the, the efforts that were heard in some, sense, in some sectors to get rid of the Outer Space Treaty never rose to the level of actual efforts to try and withdraw. So there is life in the outer space treaty, whether it will make another 50 years, I, I completely agree with you. Um, I do think it will remain in effect in 55 years. And I also think, um, I, I agree with what John said. I think there's going to be an accumulation of law around it, as you can see from Franz and me disagreeing about a couple of things, that there's room for interpretation and that we're going to have a bit more of what you call common law, customary law, um, grow up organically. The Artemis Accords are almost entirely a restatement of principles of the um, Outer Space Treaty with just a few little tweaks to you know, give a, put a little more meat on the bones. And I think we're going to see that gradually happen over the decades to come. <laughs> Hopefully not too far in advance of things because then we we'll get it wrong. But you know, as things come up, we will start figuring out the legal answers. Great. And, and with that, I'm going to thank our panelists. I'm going to thank you for your questions and your participation. Uh, we are right at time, uh, so we're going to do a very quick handover of the microphones. If you need a quick bio break or grab a bagel. Uh, we're going to be back in your chairs in five minutes to get started with the second panel. Thanks very much. Please, please, please.